from the Catholic Underground. Alrighty, today on the show, Ascension Witch Day, Drones, Avengers Assemble, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. It is indeed time for the Catholic Underground. We are your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 265, if you can believe that. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on with us. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He is the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, we got uh, Jeff Blackwell. He's the technical director of the CU. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Father. Good to be here. And also uh, on the keys, we've got uh, Katie Richard. She is um, she's sitting in for Mary Kate Taylor, who is on assignment. Also on assignment, Kathleen Lee. She's uh, she's headed to Jackson. And if you're in Louisiana, that could mean something very different than if you're actually going to Jackson, <laughs> Mississippi. Yeah. Google that. All right. Well, the the top 10 questions that we get asked as priests, Father Ryan, is actually augmented because in the United States, we have an extra reason for a question, and that is, I thought Ascension was on Thursday. <laughs> and of course, the short answer is it is, right? That's right. It's it's the Thursday. It's exactly 40 days after Easter. And of course, the whole point is that it's it's this balance. So, you know, 40 days before Easter is Ash Wednesday. 40 days after is Ascension. And it's a holy day of obligation, or it traditionally is. But for the last 40 years or so, it's been moved to Sunday, which, of course, is tragic in its own way. Yeah. What's interesting uh, is that the notion of 40 days and 40 days are very scriptural. They're in scripture. Uh, it's noted, of course, that the 40 days that Jesus is in the desert from whence we get our Lenten journey. And then in the scriptures, in the Acts of the Apostles, it talks about 40 days having transpired from the resurrection to the ascension. And so that is very much biblically based. But there, there is, there is, I would say, good reason. But that good reason sometimes uh, needs to be talked about a little bit. And, and basically it has to do with um with the notion of culpability, right? Plain and simple. Well, I, a little even bit. I would disagree about whether it's good reason, but well, the idea is is that transferring holy days of obligation, if it seems like it's going to be a real and like it's going to be really difficult to do, yeah. because the fact is most holy days of obligation all cram in together. Yeah, you have November first, December eighth, December twenty fifth, January uh, the first, uh, and then of course traditionally you had Epiphany on January sixth. Yeah. And so you're looking at five holy days of obligation in the course of two months. That, yeah. that is somewhat difficult. Right. And, of course, uh, the, the, the reason that that's given is that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, petitioned for uh, essentially kind of a dispensation to, to move Ascension Thursday to the following Sunday. So kind of moving it out of that realm of 40 days just a little bit, uh, supposedly, uh, according to, to, what, uh, to my research, uh, so that people would have the opportunity to make a holy day of obligation that they wouldn't feel kind of uh, the, the, the cumbersomeness, if that's a word, and it probably isn't, uh, of, of having to make a holy day of obligation on a Thursday. I, I kind of scratch my head a little bit because it, it's almost as if I, I see the, the goodness in it of saying, well, we want people to not fall into the state of sin because sin is bad. And so right. we, we want to give them the opportunity to go to to this important uh, this important liturgy that celebrates the ascension of the Lord, because as the first Eucharistic prayer says, this is his glorious ascension. Huh? If he doesn't do this, then we don't get the Holy Spirit, and the church isn't born. So it really is important. But the the parent, the father inside of me says, well, isn't it important to uh, kind of require your kids to do something so that they learn the discipline? Yeah, I mean, it, when you think about certain holy days of obligation that are just attached to the day of, you know, the the the, the day, it's it's the first of November, so it's All Saints Day. You say, okay, well, let me transfer that. Sure, that's that's no big deal because you know it's not even the particular day; it's All Saints Day. Mm -hmm. But then you say something like, well, this is supposed to be forty days. It's supposed to be symmetrical. Yeah. Because I mean, all all around Easter, you have 
Holy Week is balanced by the octave of Easter. And then Ash Wednesday is balanced by Ascension Thursday. And and in fact, in the old calendar, when you still had uh, pre-Lent to Septuagesima, that season, that balances out with Pentecost and Trinity Sunday. And ultimately, Corpus Christi Sunday balances with Holy Thursday. And in the middle there, you have the three Thursdays. You know, And, and in the middle of the three Thursdays, the anchor of the three Thursdays is Ascension Thursday. And so it, it really... This Ascension Thursday makes such a gigantic difference. It makes you say, you know, yeah, all the other days you can make an argument for, but this one is really bound to Thursday, not just the day of the month, but the day of the week, Thursday. It matters. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, did you ever think of the liturgical calendar as being this really well-balanced kind of scale I never did, uh, and never have, I guess, uh, to say. Now, however, I've been at um, the, um, oh, heavens, what do you call it, that, that room before you go out for Mass? Uh, vac- the sacristy. The, 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 sacristy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting old, guys. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, there is a calendar you have on the wall back there. Oh, which, yeah, the big circular one. It's a circular calendar, mm-hmm. and I don't know where you get one. I'd love to get one of those. But well, that kind of shows me that there is some balance. If you ask the sacristy fairy, she may put one under your pillow, Jeff. <laughs> okay. As long <laughs> as I don't have to lose a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not a tooth. We exact blood. Okay. No, you have to lose a cincture. That's right. It's a cincture. <laughs> okay. It was a cincture. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know if that was an answer or not. but uh, No, but I, I, I am I'm continually amazed. This is the depth of the faith, and this is why... Uh, Ascension Thursday is is important. The Feast of the Ascension is so important is when Jesus tells his his disciples, you know, I've got a whole lot to tell you, but you can't bear it now. Uh, but yeah. when the spirit of truth comes, he will give you all truth. And one of the beautiful things, one of the beautiful kind of augmentations of our faith is the little delicate things like uh, like the liturgical calendar that help keep our spirits, our souls in balance. And I think that's really what, what you're getting at there, Father, right, is it's important that our soul be in balance. And, and one of the ways that that happens is, is through the liturgical calendar. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it, today it was interesting. I preached the, um, the morning masses, but then I preached the evening mass, which was traditional Latin mass. And this is the Sunday is the Sunday in the octave of ascension. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me, and I was preaching, I was explaining it, how there are three Sundays that don't exist anymore. Um, they've been they've been absconded by Loki or somebody. There is the Sunday in the octave of Christmas, mm-hmm. which has been replaced by Holy Family Sunday. Mm-hmm. There is the Sunday in the octave of uh, the Epiphany, which has been replaced by the baptism of the Lord. And there is the Sunday in the octave of Ascension, which has been replaced by Ascension. Yeah. And each of those remind us of one of those weird spiritual things that all the spiritual masters talk about, and that's the in-between time. Yeah. You know, where you really kind of, it's, you're not thinking about Ascension, you're not thinking about Pentecost, but you're thinking about that in-between time and how mm. how the apostles must have felt between the time Jesus goes up and the these angels go and they basically pop them on the back of the head and say, stop looking up, you bunch of goofballs. Yeah. Right. And, time to get started. Then, but they're waiting. Yeah. And in that time, you know, the apostles got very nervous because they're up in the upper room and they're freaked out. Yeah. You know, so you got to think, what is it like to be 10 days, you know, in this desert with the Lord? where you just don't know what comes next. Mm -hmm. And that's such a good place to be spiritually. And unfortunately, there's no time. There used to be three Sundays in the calendar. Now there's none where we meditate upon that awkward in-between time. And so it was was a neat thing, (laughs) but it's one of those things that got me looking at. You see, the calendar had a certain wisdom to it that wasn't just, you know, kind of artificial. It was something that grew up because we realized the in-between time is something that needed its own meditation. It's just interesting. Blew my mind. But the Sunday in what you call the Octave of Ascension, is that not the seventh Sunday of Easter? It is now, but it wasn't in the past. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I, I, was, I was a bit confused, and I knew that uh, we, this is uh, what we call Ascension Sunday, which actually occurs on Thursday. It's Ascension right. Thursday, Sunday. Uh, uh, ah, okay. Well, okay, good. Well, I got yeah. it straight now. Yeah. That's right. It's, the, it's it's one of the there's a lot of it, uh, unexpected things that when when changes were made in the 60s, a lot of things we just didn't expect. You know, and we say, well, this can't be that big of a deal, and it turned into yeah. a really big deal. And and it's you know little things like removing Saint Michael the Archangel from the confidior from the uh, I confess to Almighty God, little things that don't seem giant but have have had an effect we didn't expect over the course of years. Wow. You know? Yeah, there's it's a lot to be said. One of the things I, I do enjoy uh, on, especially like octave days, like the octave of Easter, the octave of Christmas, 
I really enjoy meditating on the fact that I'm still in that moment of Easter or I'm still in that moment of, uh, of Christmas, you know, where, where you really do get to spend some time, uh, not just in the in-between, but also in the place itself. Yeah. You know, and liturgically, we, we, uh, we're not able to do that as much, although we still have octave days. But as you say, the octave days generally take place on a weekday mass. And, right. and it's hard to, to, um, to allow the entire parish into that moment. Um, uh, but, but for liturgy nerds, I will say I don't like <laughs> having to pray the Te Deum at yeah. every office of readings during yeah, an octave a, because, dude, that's just for Sundays. That's right. So liturgy nerds can unite. And, and the Te Deum is a, is a big, it's a lot to say. I still can't memorize it. I've been a priest nine years. I know. I still can't. I, I, you know, and then they're going to retranslate the breviary in the next uh, two or three years, and I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to go up and provide fizzy lifting drinks. It would be fun. helpful, yes. So okay. in the chat room, the, the chat room has been uh, unusually um, uh, verbose about this. And so Lauren says, could we just have one day named the Feast of All Holy Days of Obligation? <laughs> That's all. Just lump them all in and make it a Sunday. So... And put that on the same day as the Feast of All Sundays. So there you go. You only have to go to Mass twice a year. The Feast of All Days of Holy Obligation oh, wow. the Feast of All Sundays. I know at least some priests would be in favor of that. Yeah, Ascension Thursday, wow. uh, says David, um, should be on Thursday. But could we move the 4th of July to make long weekends every year? I yeah, like have it every month. Hey. We, we should could... celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of every month. Every month. That's very American. I like American. that idea. So, so uh, yeah, there are only, from what I uh, have been able to, because I, I wrote a bulletin article on this because uh, parishioners constantly say, Father, I thought Ascension used to be on Thursday. And I said, well, it is, but it's not, but it is, but it's not. And, uh, and it's funny because this has been, what, 40, 40 or so years that we've had Ascension on Sunday, at least in our province, as well as most provinces. Yeah. Um, but it's almost as if, like, we changed it last year, <laughs> especially <laughs> in rural parishes. Father, I thought it was Ascension Thursday last year. Well, no, it was... It was still on Sunday. Uh, I believe there are only provinces in the United States that still celebrate Ascension on Thursday are most of the provinces in the historical dioceses in uh, in the Northeast, in New England. Right. So Boston, for example, and that sort of thing. So, well, I, I'm kind of surprised that more conferences have not started at least raising the question of bringing back Holy Days of Obligation yeah. or bringing back, you know, because it, it just seems like as, as certain places realize they, they, it's not that much of a burden. Yeah. I mean, I as a priest think that there are certain days that are burdens, but you know, this one doesn't seem like one, and and neither does you know August fifteenth because they're out there in the middle of nowhere. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like it's the only time you've got anything special going on for months and months in any direction. And of course, again, part of it is is the notion of building good spiritual discipline. Part of building good yeah. holy habits. Is, is making holy days of obligation that are kind of uh, an oasis under themselves if they don't occur within that same uh, season of, of Christmas or, or of Easter. And, and those sorts of things are really, really important, very important indeed. So, yeah, um, so yeah uh, let us know how, how do you feel about Ascension. Uh, CatholicUnderground.com, you can, you can comment at Facebook.com slash CatholicUnderground. Or you can send us an email, backchat at CatholicUnderground.com, as many of you do. I have to say, this past week... Uh, I, I guess maybe it's because we've been off the air for, for a couple of weeks, but mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, a few folks have come up to me in person and, uh, you know, I, I, I never think I was standing outside the supermarket uh, getting some notary work done. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, because who doesn't like to go to a notarizer, a notarist, notary public uh, in their spare time. Anyway, so I'm standing outside the supermarket yeah. and uh, this guy walks up to me and, uh, and he says, um, he says, I want you to know. You guys are doing great on Catholic Underground. I was like, "Oh, well, wow. all right, all right. Uh, we might have to, we might have to talk about him a little bit later because he has an apostolate of mowing." Oh gosh, yes, I remember you telling me that. Mowing. But, okay, yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, the, the idea is that the person um, uh, was an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. He he goes to visit. In fact, if you're listening now, uh, good on you. He was going to visit uh, folks who who can't get to mass, and he was. Uh, bring the Eucharist to them, as an extraordinary minister would do, and he'd notice that their yards are unkempt. Oh. Because, um, you know, because the, the folks can't get out to, to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. or God, they're not well cared. They're not well manicured. Manicured. Uh, or they don't have family members that are willing to come over and help. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a sad thing, too. Yeah. And so he says, well, here I am, Lord, send me. 
And so one of the things he does on Saturday afternoons as he's mowing grass is he listens to the Catholic Underground. So to you, oh, sir, cool that? <laughs> we great. salute you and uh, we thank you for listening. Yeah, so uh, so do interact with us because that's the way that uh, we know to keep doing this every week. Um, not yeah, that we yeah. need absolute affirmation, but we rely on you to give us the things to talk about. Um, uh, and it's it's easier to not just rely on Father Ryan all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so so backchat at catholicundergroud.com. You can send the links that uh, maybe you'd like us to talk about on the show, or you can uh, get in the chat room with us at catholicunderground.tv whenever we do have one of these live shows. Uh, and speaking of which... You are listening to the Catholic Underground. We're online at catholicunderground.tv. And, of course, uh, we're online also at facebook.com slash catholicunderground. You can follow us on Twitter at Underground. I am Father Chris Decker, joined by Father Ryan Humphreys on Skype, by Jeff Blackwell, who's in the control room, and by uh, Katie Richard, who is running the video for us. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, I, I, I admit it. I'd like a drone. Uh, in fact, a new personal quadcopter drone can be operated by, are you ready for this, Father? Oculus Rift. I don't even, what is that? <laughs> I don't even know well, what that is. Uh, you game? remember back in the in the 90s when you could buy this giant headset thing that had, you know, these little video screens built into yes, it? Yes. It was about $2,200. <laughs> That's what that is. a friend of mine had one. Whoa. It was terrible. It was heavy. It was uncomfortable. Oculus Rift is this kind of 3D mesh operation that sits in your head. It provides uh, 4K video. Ooh. It provides high-def uh, audio into your ears, and it's got some wireless stuff. But it's it's extremely cool. So it's like There's, you're flying, basically. Yeah, it would be it would be something like being inside a, an eagle or or something that hovered, you know, like that. And you'd you'd have a camera built onto the bottom of the quadcopter, and uh, it you you control it obviously with a, with a controller in your hand, but it would be like you're immersed in it. I got to tell you, I, I think that if I were actually in a virtual reality simulation other than a holodeck, I would I would probably be sick to my stomach. Well, there's there's a couple of videos. If you search for Oculus Rift and you search the word Slender, is a game out there right now that's extremely uh, terrifying. It's called Slender, and it's based on Slender Man. Oh, and no. it's just a scary no. game. It would yeah, freak no. you out. But you put the Oculus Rift on, and the music is what makes Slender so scary. Yeah. And it's completely immersive, and you're in this dark environment. And you're walking around hearing all these creepy noises behind you. No, baby. And and people have said they played the game for five minutes with that and didn't sleep for a day. Yeah, well, oh, you know. Wow. Uh. So so video, but do, do a YouTube search for Oculus Rift and Slender and watch people just terrified of of, of the, the it's the immersion experience is profound. I mean, I'm looking forward to playing with it. So so father, do you have an Oculus Rift on your Amazon wish list? No, it's not on the wish list. I don't know that you can buy it from Amazon. Look it up right now. <laughs> you you might have to buy it from uh, from qualified Oculus Rift detailers. Yeah, you have to. It, it's it's still a um, it's still a developer's kit kind of thing. Oh, I see. But uh, yes, yeah, so we're not we're not there yet. Do you but, think uh, that there will yeah. ever be a time where we have retailers kind of like we have car dealerships? You know, where you have these these extreme specialty devices. They set up a brick and mortar, and you have to go in and you. And you get, uh, you know, you sit down, they hand you a, a sparkling beverage, and, and then you watch them demonstrate this thing. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 until drones and, and cars are the or same personal thing. conveyance, yeah. you know, blend into the same thing, I wouldn't think so. Although I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah. Is the doctor's conveyance still in the parking area? The answer Negative. is no. Yeah. It is in motion. But there is Google actually has now a full on self driving car that, yeah, that is not I, just the newest for me, but it but it's it's got two empty seats. There's no steering looks wheel. Looks like on a couch. Device. Yeah, yeah. It only it's, does about twenty five miles an hour, but still. You know. Right. Well, it's ugly and, and stupid, but I mean, it's coming. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm I'm extremely. I wouldn't mind sitting in an ugly, stupid car if I knew I could sit there, lean back, and say, "Take me to Florida." You know, it looks it looks like a, a little Japanese character, actually. Uh, Jeff, would you would Emoji. you buy a car like that? No, I'm too much of a control freak. I, uh, so, I kind of like see, the, the me, drive, you know. Uh, I, I'm with you, Father Ryan. If all I had to do was climb into that silly little thing and say, <laughs> "Take me to Disney World," <laughs> did you say you'd like to go to Disney World? Yes, I did. Well, to Disney World we shall go. Bling bling, and you get in and you sit on your little couch and. Maybe then you yourself could have a sparkling beverage while you went to Disney yeah, World. Yeah, you read. Yeah, you have a chance like to that. kind of sit back. You talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. 
you know. And and of course, you wouldn't say Disneyland. You'd say, "Take me to Charlie Humphrey's uh, hot tub." I would because because Father Ryan's parents have a very nice outdoor area, even oh. in their new place. I'm sure you they do. Yeah, I haven't seen the new house yet, but my dad did say he's got the the hot tub. Took an extra month to get there, and he was not amused. But now it's in place. It's all in, place. <laughs> uh, in my head. I have this image of of uh, you know a giant oversized load truck covered with you know government grade fabric <laughs> <laughs> driving down the road. Nobody going. What is what is that? That's that's Father Ryan's dad's hot tub. Oh, okay. That's oh, well, hot tub. don't forget. Yeah, that's a high security clearance on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the crossover, <laughs> which we basically just did, uh, yeah. between Silicon Valley and the real world, nonprofits are starting to take cues from startups. Now, startups were a really big thing because you had guys in flip flops and uh, checkered shirts uh, starting multi million dollar companies. And for the longest time, a lot of businesses, nonprofits included, uh, would look at the, the, the startup world and say, What are these kids doing? But these are the ones who are now uh, kind of leading the way in in the stock market and in business. I mean, Google is a very good example, and so nonprofits are starting to kind of take that cue of of the notion of lean startups, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing that makes the startup so amazing is they can be very, very agile because they're they're not bought into the we've got to have a big, complicated office space. It's got to be an expensive tower. You've got to have professional lettering on the wall in in, in Palantino or in Tahoma. At least you know. You know, or papyrus. No, father. But you can have father. You, you, you just come in. You know, you get some loft space. You put in some desks. You put in some computers, and you work. And a lot of st- of nonprofits now are trying to do something very small and specific. And they're finding that the classical models of trying to have four lawyers on retainer and all, all that stuff doesn't really help. If you want to feed some kids in a village in Africa, you get together a couple people who know what they're doing and you make it happen. And of course, given all the the technology, the cloud services and the fact you can get software service now, yeah. it means that a lot of things that used to require, you know, a very, very structured bureaucracy yeah. can now be done very, very simply. And uh, in fact, my my school at, at St. Mary's here in Natchitoches, we're taking a lot of cues from startups as well and organizing a lot of our bureaucracy the same way that a startup in Silicon Valley would do. Oh, yeah. In fact, Lauren in the chat room uh, is talking about his Ch- Catholic Charities Board. They're reading The Lean Startup by Eric Rise. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, that's a, a really good book, actually. And so, Father, you actually you have a school that's uh, that's using some of these concepts from the notion of a lean startup or of a, of a startup type situation. And I wonder if um, I mean, in fact, if you look at the Catholic Underground, <laughs> we ain't we don't have you know we got us. nothing. We got nothing. It's eight, eight years. That's got right. nothing. That's right. But but we're essentially kind of in that startup phase. We don't have a, a very high bureaucracy, you know. Um, no. But I wonder if maybe a parish wouldn't benefit from some of this because essentially a parish is a nonprofit organization. Well, I mean, my, the parish I'm at, we've been doing the same thing. And a lot of this is basic stuff. It's given the choice between something that's super high end, like exchange server or Google apps, yeah. what do you pick? Well, you exchange a few things and you don't have as much control, but Google apps is infinitely cheaper. You know, you say, well, we want to have some file shared. So instead of buying duplicate Drobo pros, you know, yeah. at $10,000 a piece, you use box.net or you use Dropbox. And and it's just thinking in terms of these things which are not as secure, right. which are not as enterprise, yeah. but which you can do for this one costs four dollars a month and that one costs four hundred dollars a month. And you know, it's just it's thinking in the sense of what do we really need, what can we swim away, what can we use on the cheap? And then too, what when we do need some bureaucracy, how can we do that well? Do you need a mahogany filing cabinet? Or can we get by with that plastic box from Office Max for six fifty? Right, uh, especially if you're being able to keep uh, some files online. I, I know I've been trying to just in my own personal um, uh, tax stuff and and business forms to scan a lot. Anything I don't have to have a hard copy of, um, I I think that that's where we need to go. Now it's interesting because in the church we are required to keep hard copies of a lot of things. Right, and and of course it's because uh, we the Catholic Church are the largest record-keeping organization on the face of the planet Earth, and probably Alpha Centauri, too. Mm. Yeah, well, after you've read that book by O'Brien, you know. Yeah, they didn't keep good records. It was all in tablets, Jeff. Tablets, and I don't mean pills. I mean big stone things. And, Jeff, you're kind of a lean startup yourself. 
Oh gosh. The Blackwell Communications Group is well group group of one right now, right? It is right now. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it started off, and uh, we, we kind of you know reached. I, I just think that my biz has changed so much. Yeah. The, the business of recording. Well, I mean, uh, the microphone you're using but, is a good example. If if you're watching us in the video feed, that's that's a ribbon mic. Yep. And and that mic is is classic, a classic microphone from uh, I dare say a bygone era. Yeah. But the fact is, it works in a, a digital application like right now. Sure. And and Jeff, uh, I would imagine that you have had to kind of rethink your entire business model, um, the way that your workflow works, mm-hmm. and, and I mean, a lot of it's gone on the internet, huh? Uh, yes, even at, at its peak, I think I had five employees, but um, mm-hmm. uh, and a couple of different uh, rooms up and recording. Uh, but you know, it, it has changed a lot because uh, first of all, the equipment has gotten a lot cheaper. Yeah. It's gotten better. Uh, the only thing that separates me from the folks who go to, to like a, a music store to buy a recording software and a microphone or a USB mic uh, is experience. So that's yeah. kind of become my selling point. But um, that's true, and yeah. and you can you really can't argue with experience. You really can't. I'm going to quote you on that. Yeah, well, good, <laughs> good. You re- <laughs> and Father Chris Decker says you really can argue with experience, which is another benefit of I don't know the Roman Catholic Church. You know, uh, we, we've been here for a while. So yeah. who else could benefit from this kind of thinking, the notion of, of the startup or the lean startup? And, and who couldn't? I mean, we've already talked, Father, about uh, about uh, churches doing this, parishes doing this, right? Yeah, I mean, I think parishes are an obvious choice. I believe schools are a choice. I think a lot of Catholic organizations, something like radio uh, or, or Catholic community radio, you know, instead, you know, there's certain laws you have to abide, FCC laws, things like that. But where you can use shared documents from Google, where you can use uh, services online that can do things more inexpensively, even things like streaming from Google Drive is a fairly, you know, astounding way to save a lot of money. And of course, what we're doing here, you know, five years ago, if you wanted to stream live video to an undetermined number of people, I mean, it was thousands and thousands of dollars. We were looking at spending over $100 a month to stream to, what was it, 16, 24 people? Wow. And now that's basically free. Of course, you limit yourself slightly in what you can do. But I think if, if people will stop thinking in terms of it's got to be big and bureaucratic and start thinking in terms of who's my audience, who am I trying to reach, and what can I do to reach them while still maintaining professionalism, I think that there's a lot of places we could probably save huge amounts of, of bureaucratic waste. That's true. Bureaucratic waste. That sounds like something that should go in a mutagen container. We can do that. <laughs> That's right. L- okay. Lauren, yeah. Lauren in the uh, chat room says the bygones were great microphone craftsmen. I think Josh, uh, not Josh, you're, you're Jeff. Jeff, if you ever start a, uh, a microphone company, you should call it the bygone. Oh, the bygone. Okay. Yeah. And I, I have a couple of classic mics. This is one of my favorite, the old, RC, uh, for our listeners, the RCA 77 DX ribbon microphone, uh, most commonly referred to as the Larry King mic. So, um, yeah. anyway, I, I just, I just love it. It's just, it's Every a time I see that microphone, I want to say, Walla Walla Washington, go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know. From, uh, from the bygone microphones, uh, which are still classic, you hang on to a microphone that nice, don't you? Um, to the heartwarming desk. Father Ryan actually has a kitten man the heartwarming desk every every uh, day. Yeah, there it oh, is. Uh huh. Yep. That's <laughs> Unfortunately, precious. that cat's name is Kevin. So. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah, Marvel's Avengers assembled to say goodbye to a top notch Catholic author, and I have to say, Father, I haven't read any of his uh, his his work. He's a, a Catholic philosopher. But uh, it's really cool to see all of the Avengers, the actors, holding up their hashtag um, for Stratford Caldecott. Yeah, I've, I've read a number of his things, and he, he's, he's very, very English. It's extremely erudite. It's extremely intelligent. It's all brilliantly insightful, but it also reads like, you know, it, it's, it's stereo instructions. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's not edge of your seat reading and you've got to be interested in the subject material, but Trevor Caldecott's a, spe- a fantastic author. And I was, this is the article that I, I read when I learned he was ill. He apparently has a, uh, some nasty cancer and he is in the final stages of his disease. And for whatever reason, this extremely brilliant Brit is a huge fan of the Marvel's franchises. And why shouldn't he be? Blah. So anyway, he's seen everything. He loves it. And it looks like now he is too sick to ever be able to wait for Captain America Winter Soldier to come to DVD. 
Uh, and so his son, in a in a, really I don't even know whether to call it a, a, almost a, Marvel like way. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, because I'm thinking, good God, man, there's there's torrents everywhere, but in, in a way that is beautifully moral. <laughs> Uh, has asked the company to send a DVD screener to his dad so that he can watch it before he dies. And he also asked via Twitter that the stars um, would uh, would take selfies with a hashtag sign. Um, the cap hashtag for Strat. Cap for Strat. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, uh, as of this writing, 14 have done theirs, which is amazing, and four have not. And it's it's weird, but it's beautiful and heartwarming at the same time. Yeah, this is a really good example of um, of, of how Twitter can be used for the force of good. You know, um, and and I know that that there are many other uh, kind of uh, active things that that people are doing on Twitter. But this is, as you say, it's a good heartwarming thing of, of a guy who who likes the franchise and and whether you like the the cinematography or the the story or whatnot. Um, when somebody is in a state like uh, in a, in a stage four of cancer. To have something that you can enjoy, something that you can lose yourself in, something you can immerse yourself in, that is that is also kind of aligned with goodness, because that's what the Avengers are all about. I think it's a really, really cool thing uh, that his son said, yep, yeah, you know what we're going to do? We're going to ask Marvel, but we're also going to get the actors to, to come on board. That's a really, really cool thing. Jeff, you like yeah. heartwarming things. Oh, indeed, This I is do. a good idea. It is a great idea, and in fact, I was just looking at the article. It, 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 it is confirmed. Let me see here. Mar- Marvel Studios says they are they're going to do it. Huh? They're definitely going to do this. Send them a private right? screening. I, I, really, I think that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's, to me, what's so uh, heartwarming about it is that the actors are getting involved and they're spreading the word. Of course, they have a huge fan base, uh, so it can only lead to, I think, a lot of good. I think the thing that would make it really cool is if the uh, actors showed up to watch the screening. I, that would be, that would just put me over the top. In fact, I might yeah, have, that would be I might catch cool. the vapors and faint. Because I just, <laughs> you, you know, because sometimes you do. The vapors, they... Come yes, over you. They do. So I'm told. <laughs> well, uh, before we catch the papers, we'll do this. You are listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at CatholicUnderground.tv. Uh, you can catch the vapors with us every week, Sunday at uh, <laughs> at 8, 7 Central. At CatholicUnderground.tv, also uh, on Catholic Community Radio in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Homa, and the Gulf Coast. And you can always visit our website at CatholicUnderground.com. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining me, Father Ryan Humphreys over in the Skype uh, universe, Jeff Blackwell, and Katie Richard. And, uh, of course, our picks of the week are coming up soon. But first, we want to talk a little bit about uh, the CW. We talked about the new TV season, and uh, there is a controversy with uh, with a program that is slated, uh, that's called Jane the Virgin. Okay, now this sounds interesting enough. You might be saying, "Oh, Jane the Virgin." Well, it's you know about a girl who's waiting until marriage, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. Well, the premise is simple enough. Jane's a good girl. She's got a plan. She's got self determination, and she goes to visit her OBGYN uh, during a, a standard visit, you know, run of the mill visit, and she is accidentally given uh, an artificial insemination. I don't really know how that would happen but that's the premise of the show and basically the show deals with how she deals with all of this and whether or not she should have an abortion the interesting thing is the cw is calling the show a light-hearted comedy but it doesn't seem like that that's all there is to it i mean i don't know how you make a a multi-season show out of this uh but here's one of the things we we talk all the time about the importance of television and internet being able to tell the important stories of good and evil uh, and, and how literature, at least from time immemorial, has done that. You know, the, the notion of morality plays, the notion of literature as, as holding up a what is good, what is bad. Television has a very important part to play in that. In the golden age of television, we saw that. Uh, I just, I, I, I wonder if that will happen in this program and I also wonder if this is just kind of one of those money-led endeavors to capitalize upon a so-called hot political topic. Uh, I hope it, that, that if this show does go ahead, if it gets the green light, that will invite good reflection. But I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm a little, I'm withholding judgment. Because, you know, Father, one of the things that, that I'm, I, I'm reading a really good book called uh, Save the Cat. And it's on screenwriting. And one of the things that it talks about is, you know, one of the reasons that all of the movies that, that are coming out now are, are reboots, 
Jeff, have you noticed a lot of reboots? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. A lot of sequels, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not so much because there's a story to tell, but it's because it's an easy sell to uh, to a film company. Yeah. If we know who the characters are, if we know that it grossed a lot of money, if we know we can squeeze another story out of it, all I have to do is kind of give you the elevator pitch, and I'm in. And it's based uh, very little on actually having a story to tell. And so I wonder if this, I mean, I'm just trying to think in, in the eyes of, uh, of, a, of a Hollywood television producer, is it just the political topic, the so-called political topic, which we know is a moral topic, mm-hmm. or is there more to it? I don't know. What do we think? Father, do you have any thoughts? Well, you're breaking up a good bit. I don't know if you're hearing this or not. I am. You I are. Am. Outstanding. Yeah. Um I, I think I would like to play the devil's advocate on it and say that abortion's happening a lot. It's happening more and more. And so I think discussion of it, even in a slightly slanted way, can be a good thing because so much of the discussion is just dismissed now. Well, all, cra- all yeah. Christians are crazy and anti-woman, therefore that's it. Uh, and so I like the idea of if you're going to spend episode after episode, even in a comedy sense talking about it, that at least it's going to be able to raise some questions and they're going to have to present at least a cursory effort of both sides. So yeah. I don't really, it doesn't seem like the kind of show I would watch, but yeah. at the same time, you know, even if it's slanted, I think it's good to have discussion because I, I think about characters like Ron Swanson on yeah. Community uh-huh. who, even though he's meant to be the fool, is actually beloved of a lot of people because he represents the every man. Yeah. We have to remember that Hollywood represents a very small portion of the of the the actual people in the United States. Yeah. And so if they want the show to work, they're going to have to represent the alternative opinion. And that could be a good thing. It very well could be. Jeff, uh, would you watch? Probably not. I, I don't watch a lot of TV anyway. If I do, it's something that, you know, I have to be uh, uh, sort of interested in. More, more of my stuff is going to be like the History Channel or something that's, you know, technical or... Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I wonder what kind of audience this would get, yeah. you know? I mean, the Tomorrow People didn't even get renewed for a first season. I think that was an awesome series. So I wonder if something like this that's kind of presented as a lighthearted comedy. I mean, dealing with, with sensitive issues in a way that's lighthearted can help to tell the story, yeah. you know? Um, I just hope that, that as you say, Father, uh, both sides are... Are uh, are represented again. It's called uh, it's called Jane the Virgin, and it's slated for the CW. And I just don't see how it can last very long, like you said. I yeah. just uh, you know we'll see. Yeah, I don't there know. So along the same line of thinking, uh, Philip Blosser at Musings of a Pernicious <laughs> <laughs> Pernicious Pernicious Papist. Really, <sighs> pertinacious, pertinacious, <laughs> Papist. <laughs> no more alliterations for you, Philip Blosser. Uh, asks, can we like the Pope? Too much, hmm. Father? Can we? I think the the there's a yes and a no to it in, in the sense that can we can we like or love the Pope? You know, too much. Well, in a certain sense, no. We we love the man. You know, I can't like or love my mother too much. But on the other hand, can we give the Pope too much credence, or can we like him to the degree that we're not willing to look at his faults and failings? Mm-hmm. Yes, and. The, the one thing we've that's been so radically odd about the last year is that the, everybody in the media hated Benedict XVI like he was the Antichrist come to earth for years, for eight years. And then all of a sudden Francis shows up, he smiles, and all of a sudden everybody likes him. And there there ought to be, among anyone who's sane, a certain sense of 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 slowness because if there's if there's this extreme polar opposite you know there ought to be a sense of let's take let's take stock of the situation mm-hmm. you know and and i think that that that's the argument that that Blosser is making is we can't love the man too much yeah. but we can be blinded by liking him a little too much and and that's one of the things that that i always caution in fact i said this uh, probably the week after um his pontificate began and uh, and parishioners started kind of coming up to me and and saying all the things that Pope Francis had done or was going to do. I said, well, the guy's only been in office for, for a week. And so I don't know where you're getting your news, but always beware of a man that society and the mainstream media canonize. You know, not not beware of the Pope because he is, right. no. But, but whenever society begins writing a narrative, 
you know, whenever our mainstream culture, media culture begins writing a narrative, that's always a cause for us to, to be cautious. And, and again, it, 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 uh, it's recognizing that the Holy Father is who he is. He is the successor of Peter, and, and because he is, he certainly um, deserves our esteem for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then to be able to, to look at uh, what he does, uh, the things that he does officially, the things that he does unofficially, and to be able to make uh, adult decisions about that, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's difficult to remember is that that the Pope is a human being right. and that because of, of the history of the church, we've seen all kinds of popes. Now, the, what most of us who, who are your age, my age, have been limited to Pope John Paul, the Saint, Pope John Paul the Great, yeah. and to Benedict XVI, and that's the extent of our knowledge. Right. Some people will be able to think back to Paul VI, think back to John the Twenty Third, even the Piuses, but mm-hmm. we don't have a broad history of papal history, and we certainly don't remember those times when when society and the news loved the Pope and and in almost a, a sycophantic way that they do now. Yeah. And in fact, there was a time when we had to declare a heresy called ultramontanism, where people mistook the the uh, authority of the Pope and the personality of the Pope and got into the opinion that everything the Pope says is true, regardless of, of, of all other details. And of course, there was a constant concern about that with Pope John Paul II, because he wrote about everything. Yeah. Um, you know, Pope Benedict XVI was much, much more reserved in his writing. And we know that Pope Francis has already said to radio, uh, Vatican Radio, no, you cannot publish my daily sermons because they don't count for the whole church. Right. Those sermons are for the people in that room. And so you ought not to publish what I say mm. because although I'm the Pope, at that point, I'm just saying mass for a crowd of people. Right. You know, and so in, in our heads, it's hard to keep that separate because remember when we hear the Pope talk, we're getting somebody who takes an excerpt mm-hmm. of what he says, right. and we don't actually have the full text. So we see a press conference on on a, a, an airplane. Mm-hmm. We get the one money quote, but we have no idea about the context. Yeah. And so it's very easy for a pope who is excited, enthusiastic, and a malicious media mm-hmm. to use him like a puppet. And we've seen that over and over again, where the pope has said something, and we've gone, good Lord. <laughs> and it turns <laughs> out that he that. said yeah. that, but he said it in yeah. the midst of a paragraph, and they quoted three words. Right. So yeah. we, we do need to be cautious of saying that everything the Pope says is magically delicious because in a certain sense, that's the heresy of ultramontanism. What we really need to do is take a step back and say, you know, this is the Pope, he's speaking, but when he speaks for the, officially for the church, we have to pay attention to that in a special way. When he's kind of off the cuff and talking to a group of kids about how whether or not he thinks that Harry Potter is great or not, right. that actually is not papal teaching. Right. And that applies to Benedict and John Paul sure. II too. Yeah. In that in that specific instance as well with Harry Potter, Benedict was not a fan. Yeah, you know, and and that's mm-hmm. that's that's okay. So basically, put the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth. Yeah. Um, he deserves respect. He deserves prayer. He's the head of the church, meaning he deserves our attention because uh, his perspective is certainly different than ours, and 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 our obedience as well. Which is why whenever Benedict the Sixteenth, you know, over tea says, you know, I'm not really big on Harry Potter. I'm still going to listen. I'm I'm going to mm-hmm. read what he said. I'm going to to take that to to my own prayer, my own reflection, huh? Uh he's also a theologian of sorts. Now, now Francis is not in the same league as uh St. John Paul II, who who was a you know, philosopher, theologian extraordinaire. Uh but in the same way, uh, Pope Francis also deserves a certain intellectual deference that oh yes, this is the Holy Father. He has thought about this. He has probably prayed about it more than I have, and so I do need to listen. I do need to take this uh, in. Uh, he's also a human being. He deserves the benefit of the doubt and our love. Uh, in his opinions, uh, we don't give intellectual assent. We're not required to say whatever he says. He's infallible, and that's that. That's that's kind of uh, one of the, the the things that a lot of folks would say. Uh, you know, that don't necessarily know why Catholics do what we do and in, in the way that we are with uh, with the Holy Father. Is no, he's not. He's not infallible in his interpretation of uh, of the morning newspaper. You know, that's he's he's a human being. Right. Um, and then, of course, uh, as as we said, just as John Paul's opinions and Pope Benedict's opinions didn't get automatic intellectual assent, neither should we should neither should we give an uncritical agreement to everything that any pope or bishop says. You know, I mean, we certainly uh, have to recognize the the mode in which they are teaching, um, but we also have to use our own human brains too. You know, mm-hmm. I got to tell you that one of the things that attracted me as as an old Protestant to the Catholic Church, yep. uh, some twenty four years ago. Uh, because I had um, followed uh, a man 
at in the pulpit and yeah. um, uh, had you know believed in him and 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 kind of took my focus off of Christ. Yeah. But as I learned that every day in every Catholic church in the world, yeah. there's this. It, it, there's some organization to the teaching, sure. uh, uh, the teaching that uh, Jesus handed down to those who became popes. Correct. And yes, they are men; they're human beings, but they're still following uh, this this purpose. That yeah, that, they themselves are servants of something bigger than themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Jesus, and, and that's what what attracted me to the Catholic Church. I'm like, now wait a minute. I I, I want to know what happened after. Jesus ascended into heaven, mm-hmm. and where did the church go from there? How did you know <laughs> after those forty days? Yeah, what happened? Exactly, just yeah. what happens. But um, so the focus shouldn't not be on the man. Yes, we need to have a leader. We do have a great leader in, yeah, in Pope Francis. We do. So, mm-hmm. so, so, Father, it, it goes uh, it goes without saying. How do we understand a priest or a bishop who disagrees with the Pope? Because there have been things. Uh, that uh, that our present Holy Father have said that I have to go. Well, you know, uh, I have to let let's break this down. Let's break this apart. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, because you know, Father, you and I have both talked about how uh, there are a lot of things that require a lot of qualification whenever Pope Francis speaks off the cuff, right? Right. And and so when when we when we see that a bishop or a priest disagrees with the Holy Father, we first say, well, what was it? Was it the encyclical he wrote or was it, you know, just a, 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 an excerpt that Vatican Radio made of a sermon he gave? So, you right. know, these very, very different categories. And then we say, well, OK, did that person do it with charity? Because if you have somebody who's angry, yeah, that's a whole issue. Um, there are certain quotations like the infamous who am I to judge? That's mm-hmm. opinion. Right. Trickle down economics, injustice is the cause of all sin. Those are also opinions. Now, he the, the the broader principles of them are not opinions, but applying them in these specific ways are. And so one can agree or not, but the necessity of serving the poor, the talk about the devil, the doctrinal stuff, to yeah. these we owe agreement not because the Pope said it, but because this is what the church believes. They're in the catechism. And we have to remember that with all priests and bishops, we should not necessarily say that priest is fantastic. Look at him. He's amazing. I believe every word that came out of his mouth. We believe because that person is expounding the truth of the church. Yeah. And, you know, it's like John Paul II said when he when he uh, said that women could not be ordained as priests. He says, I'm not saying anything new here. This is the teaching of the church. I'm simply affirming this is the teaching of the church. And so, too, we, we, when we, when we have a, a person or someone who disagrees with a bishop or a priest or a pope, we, they, if they're disagreeing that his interpretation is, is, you know, to this situation is not okay, fine. But if that person says the Pope's wrong, I think that, um, we should be able to do whatever we want. We say, well, what does the church say? Right. And if the Pope's agreeing with the church, nobody disagrees. That's it because he's teaching what the church teaches and that's what God made him to do. Exactly, and and that is why I think Francis would, pro- if I can put words in the Holy Father's mouth, he would he would say that as well. That uh, I I teach what the Church teaches and nothing else, and and that um, that's definitely where we we have to look. Well, we at Catholic Underground have another place around this time every week uh, where we look, and we call it the CU Pick of the Week. All right, for our first CU Pick of the Week, uh, Jeff, why don't we head over to you? Because we've been talking about uh, microphones. <laughs> microphones. Yeah. <laughs> it's my life. Uh, and any, anybody who's watched any TV shows or played in a band in the last, oh, heavens, 30, 40 years are familiar with the old Shure microphones. The uh, the 58s are typically the uh, vocal mics, and the 57s, uh, they're used on the drums. And uh, they've also been used as um, like guitar amp mics and vocal oh, yeah. mics. Anyway, uh, the, the Sure people back uh, 75 years ago, ago created the uh, Unidyne 55, and um, it went away for a while, but they, they hung on to the mold uh, of, of the microphone and uh, started reproducing them again back in the late 60s. Oh, I love that mic. And, uh, I, in fact, I have the, uh, the 55SH, um, and uh, the, uh, it, it looks identical, but what they do is they have the pickup of a, uh, of a Shure 57 in it, but it's a really good-sounding microphone. And it looks cool. Um, it looks retro, and uh, it's the 75th birthday. And uh, so the Shure people, what they did is they came up with this, uh, you can – Print out, and it works better on cardstock. If you print out the build your own microphone 
It's, it's kind of like a cutout like you did with uh, back in the 60s with paper dolls and yeah. and figures and stuff like that. So Very neat. It's kind of fun. You submit to, you can do, you also submit the pictures of your own um, Sure microphone uh, that you cut out and put together uh, oh. to their blog. Anyway, we have uh, a link in the uh, the show notes at catholicunderground.tv. I think that's the uh, the Sure microphone that Elvis Presley is singing into on the 29 cent stamp. Uh, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. And in fact, I, I I went to a tour of Sun Studios up in Memphis, Tennessee a few years ago, and they have the original microphone that the studio used back in those days when they had the big four, which are, oh, yeah. can you can you name them? It was Elvis Presley, uh-huh. Johnny Cash, right. Uh, Father Ryan going to help out here? Carl I, Perkins? I've got nothing. Oh, you don't have a, okay. Was one of them Kevin? Was it a kitten? That's I it. Don't... Kevin the kitten. There yeah. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Manning the heartwarming desk. Anyway, I have a picture of that microphone back at the, the studio. Very cool. Yeah. Anyway, the sure people done it again. I I, I always like Jeff's picks of the week. Yeah, <laughs> Father Ryan, your pick of the week. So this this day brought us Reader Two. Reader is the iOS app that became a Mac app that is a killer way to read all your RSS feeds. It, it and when um when Google uh, Reader died when it was canceled because people hate me um <laughs> they they basically fell to pieces and at that point we talked a little bit about what happened with feedly and feedbin and others that kind of disappeared and who was going to pick up the slack well reader basically fell out of commission and and it's been now two years but they finally got it working again and it's beautiful it's a beautiful app and so i recommend reader too it's it's got most of the features i like but at the same time, there's another app I've been using in the last two years I've grown fond of called ReadKit. And so there's two apps. They're very similar, but they have a different polish on, on each kind of different directions. And so Reader 2 and ReadKit, if you're somebody who's still using a lot of RSS feeds, which is something I very, very strongly recommend, both of them support Tumblr. Both of them support all kinds of sending to Buffer and sending to Facebook oh, wow. and sending to Twitter. It's a really excellent way to get your news and keep it organized. But uh, but Reader 2 and ReadKit both. Reader 2 costs about 10 bucks. I think ReadKit probably costs 5 um, But check them out. They're both for Mac only. But uh, if you're an RSS person, they're, they're, you, they're must try. So so take a look. The links are in the show notes. I try to, uh, to, to get back into RSS reading, uh, thanks to Father Ryan, because I find that it is actually a, an easier way uh, over my morning bowl of cereal is, is to have everything kind of in the same spot, uh, even though as an artist, I, I like to, to see the design of websites. I also like things like, I'm going to have to check out the new reader. I'm using Pocket for a lot of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. but even still, Pocket is is not uh, an RSS feed in Jester in the same way, right? Right. Yeah. And what I, what I actually do from either one of these is I, I, I read through stuff that's short. Stuff that's longer form goes straight to Pocket. And I have a shortcut key, Butterfly S, oh, there you and go. then it goes to Pocket, and then I'll read Pocket, um, after I'm done with my bravery in the uh, confessional. There you go. Yeah, I kind of do the same thing. Finish my bravery, and I, I catch up uh, on, usually it's it's uh, uh, religious articles and things from blogs that I've wanted to read in the confessional. You've probably always wondered what priests are doing while they're waiting for you in the confessional. <laughs> Chances now, are we're reading. We know. <laughs> yeah, I, of course, I've been reading Father Elijah again. We, we talk about mm -hmm. that on the show, uh, yeah. Michael D. O'Brien. Anything by Michael D. O'Brien is good confessional reading. I don't know, Father, do you have a rule that there are certain things you don't read in the confessional? Yeah, I, I, I do too. I, I, have the, I keep my Kindle. I have an old Kindle I keep in there. And it's mostly religious works. I'm trying to rework my way through all of John Paul II's great encyclicals. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm rereading all of Vatican II as well. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there are some works of fiction I'm okay with. Yeah. As long as the work of fiction is is what I would call a Catholic work of fiction. Right. About as secular as it gets is I read Brideshead Revisited in there yeah. um, a couple of days. Um, it's a very, very tame book, but also one of these great books about conversion. And sure. so, I would, you know, but, I would it's, but it's not a religious the, book, strictly speaking. I would put that in the Catholic fiction kind of, you know, uh, area, I suppose. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I tend to read the, the, the same. I have the same kind of self-imposed rule, too, um, so that you can kind of keep it. Keep it on the religious side, y'all. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, my pick of the week, uh, I'll actually, if, if you're watching us in the video feed, if you're not, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just describe it to you. It's called the Square Jellyfish. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, for for our video viewers, I'll, I'll turn over and show you exactly what the square jellyfish is. It is a a iPhone um, a, a tripod mount. So oh, okay. so anywhere you go, every now and then you want to take good video. The iPhone is a good camera to take video on, and uh, and so I here, I will show on the video feed. It's this little spring loaded iPhone. Um, caddy kind of thing yeah so it's a whole, holds right. the, yeah so it, it, holds it springs back down so if you have an iphone that has like an otter box or some yeah. giant thing on it, it will actually spring oh look and at you. it will expand to the size that you need which is the big problem i was having with um with with having something to hold the iphone to use for video mm -hmm. is is that if i had a, an otter box or a large thing it, it would right. hold and so this actually uh it, it come it breaks apart very easily um, it's on Father Ryan's Gorilla Pod, which I stole from Natchitoches. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll bring it back to you. Uh, but then it, it it fits on a standard camera mount, oh, and so okay. you've got you've got a, a perfect little iPhone tripod mount, and so you just keep it in your pocket or nice. wherever you keep your you know peripherals, and uh, and bring it along with you. And so if I say, oh, I need something to go to YouTube, all I have to do is set it up, and it's gone. Yeah. So so. Mine is the uh, the square jellyfish, and on the website for square jellyfish, they have a lot of other little uh, ancillary kind of things yeah. too uh, that that you can use um, along with that. They have like uh, Bluetooth operated remotes and things like that. So that's my pick of the week. Let us know what your picks of the week are. Backchat at catholicunderground dot com. That's the way to do it. And we always thank those who help us, right, Jeff? Indeed we do, and portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's right, and uh, certainly if you are listening to us and you like what we do, head over to catholicundergroundcom slash donate and, uh, and, and help us out. Uh, if it's been a while since you've updated your credit card info, uh, please do so. I, I noticed that uh, I, I don't check our donation stuff very often. That's why we have Joshua LeBlanc uh, over in his, his ivory Stanley's Tower. Uh, but, uh, but, but check all the stuff and make sure your donation stuff is, uh, is, is in order. All righty. Uh, I'm glad you, you did that, by the way, yeah. because it's okay to, 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 to pass the plate every now and then. Oh, that's true. I mean, and we can't continue to do what we do without your that's help. Exactly I mean, right. as, as much as as much as we'd like to say, uh, it'll just come out of Father Ryan's pocket. No, we can't do that because <laughs> we know how much we get paid as priests. So, and this is this is a completely lay led apostle. It is led by you. Yes. Uh, Father Ryan and I actually just work for you. So. That's the way that it goes. If you want the show notes that accompany this episode of the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate and what we do, if you want to connect with us, if you want to donate, catholicundergroundcom is the website. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org, and he's at fr Humphreys on Twitter, and he's got a lot of really cool stuff on his website too. Uh, it's rocking and rolling over there in Natchitoches. Thank you, Father. You're very welcome. Jeff Blackwell is the technical director for the Catholic Underground. He is the ruling despot at the Blackwell Communications Group, jeffblackwell.us. And on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellus. Thank you, Jeff. It's an honor and privilege, Father. That's right. Uh, Katie Richard is is over there in the video cave, and we thank her for her help. She came in just to watch Jeff uh, work on the audio board, but we pressed her into service her for a mile. Her, and right. boy, she has gone with us, too. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs, CatholicUnderground.tv, for more from the CU. We thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the digital continent. We are Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gone Digital. And we will see you next time.